Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise, for He truly is worthy to be praised. I was glad when they said unto us, let us go into the house of the Lord. We greet you in the name of the Father, our Creator, Son, Jesus, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Comforter. Thanks for all the churches that are represented. We thank God for our deacons and our deacon wives, and we thank God for the choir, and we thank God for all of you, the members of Friendship, Greater New Jerusalem, and Mount Olive, Glenville. We just great all of you we thank god for your faithfulness for coming out and participating in this worship experience god has brought us a mighty long ways and he continued to keep us in perfect peace again my brothers and sisters there is a word from the lord this morning and we would like for us to just bow down on a prayer our father and our god we come this morning again lifting up your holy name we come standing behind this sacred death realizing how good you have been to us we come now standing to preach and teach your word father god we actually now father god let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight for lord you are our strength and our redeemer it is in jesus name we pray amen my brothers and sisters, as we continue to focus on God's Word, I would like for you to turn this morning with me to Paul's epistle to the church at Philippi, the book of Philippians, chapter number 1, and we would like to start reading at verse number 19 and end at verse number 21. Again, Philippians Chapter number 1, verse number 19, and it reads, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Verse 20, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. 21, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You may be seated. My brothers and sisters, allow me to read verse number 21 again. It says, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. So my brothers and sisters, for a few moments this morning, allow me to preach from this thought or this subject. I'm in a no-lose situation. Come on, say it with me. I'm in a no-lose situation. Ushers, thank you for your service. My brothers and sisters, when we look at the background this morning, the church at Philippi was founded during the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey. My brothers and sisters, the epistle to the Philippi congregation has always been one regarded as one of Paul's most personal letters and tender communication. Although Paul was writing from prison, Joy is a dominant theme throughout this letter. He was a prisoner accused of preaching Christ within the established church. So my brothers and sisters, as we continue from first Sunday, where we allow us to preach from Philippians chapter 1 verse 1 through 7, we hammered home the point that we are to remember others in our prayers. And this was done through the prayer of partnership, the prayer of unity, and the prayer of vision, keeping our eyes focused on Jesus. And this is what Hebrews 12 and 2 says. It said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to encourage you this morning, regardless of where you are in life, regardless of where you've been through, regardless of what you're going through right now, 
The truth is we're called upon to play the cards or the hand we have been dealt. Well, growing up like many of you this morning, I grew up playing cards. I, I, I grew up playing spades. I, I grew up playing checkers. And, and, and I love checkers. And my family know I love checkers because I remember that whoever got the king first was in control of the game. I can remember saying, crown me. And then I would fly up and down the Mason-Dixon line waiting for those to cross over so I could take their pieces and say, it's over, it's finished. But can I tell you this morning that also in the spiritual realm, that I say, I've been, I have Jesus, so I say, crown me. Because as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. In other words, what I'm saying this morning, as long as I got Jesus, our situation, my situation, will always come out on top. But my brothers and sisters, there are times in life when we all are on the wrong side of the fence. We seem to be on the wrong team. And we're outside the will of God. But ain't you glad that God is not through with you yet? That he's able to redeem you from your past and give you a new future? And this is what Paul is saying. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away and all things become new. I can hear Paul this morning saying, my brothers and sisters, I'm in a no-lose situation because falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever done. My brothers and sisters, there comes a time in life when we must realize that regardless of what we've been through, life is not over until God says it is over. I just want to encourage you this morning, friendship, that God is in control and he will help us to finish what we have started. But can I tell you this morning, because of our human nature, no one gets joy out of suffering. But yet the Apostle Paul, throughout the book of Philippians, demonstrated joy in suffering, joy in serving, joy in believing, joy in giving. It was the motto. He understood that as long as he had Christ, he could do just a little bit more. The secret of his joy is grounded in his relationship with Christ. People today definitely want to be happy, but often consider the worldly alternative and consider Christ as the last option. My brothers and sisters, let's be clear. Christ is the solution for the world problem today. Christ is the antidote for the world problems today. Christians are to be joyful in every circumstance, even when things are going badly, even when we feel like complaining, even when we, when we, when no one else is joyful. And this is why James said, count it all joy when you enter into divers' temptations. So my brothers and sisters, the book of Philippians remains a lasting tribute to the Apostle Paul's attitude towards suffering. Paul was able by the will and the favor of God to rejoice under trying circumstances of his captivity and his impending fate. His inner joy came from his sincere dedication, fulfilling his mission for God. This was the center of his life. Can I tell you this morning, God never promised the road to be easy. But as the psalmist said, he did promise us to be our refuge, our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. My brothers and sisters, Paul allowed nothing to get in the way of spreading the good news everywhere he went. On life journey, my brothers and sisters, there are certain circumstances that will test our faith 
and our commitment for the cause of Christ. But whatever happened, we're never at a loss. We're never in a losing situation. Because in verse 13, it gives us the backdrop in the scenario on how Paul ended up in a Roman prison in bonds. The Bible says while he was on a visit to Jerusalem, some Jews had him arrested for preaching the gospel. And he appeared unto Caesar to hear his case. He was then escorted by soldiers to Rome where he was placed on house arrest while awaiting his trial. Not a trial for breaking the civil law. Not a trial for breaking the speed limit. But a trial for proclaiming the good news about Christ. My brothers and sisters, at that time, the Roman authority did not consider this to be a serious charge. A few years later, however, Rome would take a different view of Christianity and make every effort to stamp it out of its existence. My brothers and sisters, Paul, house arrest allowed him some degree of freedom. He could have visitors. He could continue to preach. He could write letters such as this one. But my brothers and sisters, the good news is that whatever God has ordained, no one can stop it. In verse 15 through 18, throughout Paul's ministry, he had an amazing selfless attitude to pray and to help others along the way. He knew that some were preaching to be all about reputation, taking advantage of his imprisonment to try and make a name for themselves. But regardless of the motives of these preachers, Paul rejoiced that the gospel was still being preached. Some Christians serve today all for the wrong reasons. God doesn't excuse the motive. But we should be glad if God uses the message regardless of the motive. In verse 19 and 21, which is the key to our text this morning, it said, according to scripture, this was not Paul's final imprisonment in Rome. But he didn't know that at this time. Awaiting trial, he knew he could either be released or executed. However, he trusted Christ to work it out for his deliverance. And he said, shall turn to my salvation. Can I tell you this morning, whether he lived or died, he wanted to honor Christ. As it turned out, he was released from this imprisonment, but arrested again some three years later. My brothers and sisters, Paul had Christ on the inside. And everywhere he went, he wanted to ensure everyone knew his stand, his position, that he was on the Lord's side. To those who don't believe in God, life on earth is all there is. And so it is natural for them to strive for the world's value, for money, for popularity, for power, for prestige, for status. But for Paul, however, life meant developing eternal values and telling others about what Christ had done in his life. Who alone can help see us through the eternal perspective? Can't nobody else help us? My brothers and sisters, we can't even save ourselves. But it is Christ who can redeem us from our sin. Paul's whole purpose in this life, my brothers and sisters, was to speak boldly for Christ and to become more like him. No one likes to talk about death, but Paul could comfortably say that dying would be even better than living. I know none of us in here this morning can say that I would rather die than live, but Paul had a position because in death, he could be spared from the troubles of this world. And he could eventually see Christ face to face. And this is why John reminds us in the book of Revelation, chapter, chapter 21, verse number 4. And John said, and God shall wipe away all 
tears from my eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. My brothers and sisters, Paul's message is clear. That if you're not ready to die, then you're not ready to live. My brothers and sisters, when you were certain of your eternal destiny, then you are free to serve, to vote your life to what really counts, without the fear of dying. My brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul reminds us that believers can have profound contentment, serenity, and peace no matter what happens in life. He says unto us this morning that this joy comes from knowing Christ personally and from depending on his strength rather than our own. He says unto us this morning, he said, joy does not come from the outward circumstances but from that which is within. He says as Christians we must not rely on what we have or what we experience to give us joy but on Christ that is within us. We say it, but do we really mean it? That this joy that I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. So my brothers and sisters, Paul shows us how to live successful Christian lives. We can become mature by being so identified with Christ that his attitude of humility and self-sacrifice becomes ours. Christ is both a source of power and our guide. Developing a character begins with God to work in us, but also requires us to have self-discipline, obedience to his word, and concentration on our part. So my brothers and sisters, as I considered this message this morning, I can hear Paul singing. I'm not worried about my soul because I fixed it up with Jesus a long time ago. Can I say that again? I'm not worried about my soul because I fixed it up with Jesus a long time ago. My brothers and sisters, in these three verses, Paul wants to let us know that his soul is anchored in Jesus. And I don't know how you're feeling about it, but we are called to build our foundation on the rock. And Jesus is the rock of our salvation. So this morning, allow me to share three things with you. Point number one is Paul's deliverance and strength. In verse number 19, Paul said, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul, in verse number 19, he knew that through his prayers and through the prayers of others and the provision of Spirit of Jesus that he would be delivered from his circumstances. It's the same with David says in Psalm 23 and 1, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. But David, my brothers and sisters, knew that God was in control. And when you know that, you, that God is in control, you can say things like he said in Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Paul was not guessing. Paul was not tossing up a coin. He said to them who are called according to his purpose. Paul knew he would be delivered, but also absolute and confident that he will be saved from his circumstances. And this is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, he said, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. More gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'm in a no-lose situation. And as I reflect on the Old Testament this morning, I can hear the cry of Daniel in the lion's den. 
I could hear the cry of the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace saying that my God is well able to deliver me. But if he don't do anything else for me, he's already done enough. There, that's my position. That should be your position. And this is the Apostle Paul position. That for God I live and for God I surely die. Point number two this morning is Paul's expectation and hope. Verse number 20. Paul says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether I be by life or by death. And Paul dealt with his circumstances of being in prison, not understanding what will happen. He, but he considered the future. He had an honest expectation and hope that through the prayers of the Philippian church and the work of the Holy Spirit, that he would be delivered. And bringing no shame to the name of Christ. My brothers and sisters, Paul's expectation and hope can be seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. And he said, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building, a house not made with hand, eternal in the heavens. Paul says, I'm in a no-lose situation. And as believers today, my brothers and sisters, we're not like the world that has no hope because we have hope of Christ. And I'm reminded of John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3. It said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, that ye may be also. I'm in a no-lose situation. If God doesn't do anything else for me, he's already done enough. My brothers and sisters, Paul saying this morning is, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Romans 14 and 8 said, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord. We're in a no-lose situation. And point number three, our final point. My brothers and sisters, Paul stand in creed. Paul stand in creed. In verse 21, it said, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul is saying he cannot lose. For him to live is Christ, which is good, and to die is heavenly gain, which is also good. Paul is saying, I'm in a no-lose situation. And for Paul and for every true Christian, death though an enemy, he reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 26, he said it is simply a door to pass through in order to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. And there's no other place Paul would rather be. More than just not being ashamed. My brothers and sisters, Paul wanted to be bold in exalting Christ and all that he said and he did, even if it meant death. No matter the threat against him, including physical harm or death, Paul realized that nothing could separate him from the presence of the Lord. In the contrasting statement, in Paul's creed, he's in a no-lose situation. That for him to die is gain. Paul is not afraid of death because he no longer has the victory. He's reminding us that Jesus Christ has conquered it and promised his follow eternal life in heaven. The sting of death, which is sin, has also been conquered. And Paul knew he could stand before God with confidence because Jesus' death had paid in full the price of his sin. And this is why Paul says in Galatians 2 
in verse number 20. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. My brothers and sisters, as I reflected on this message, when I considered the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., from the time he got involved in the Montgomery bus boycott, his life was continuously in danger. My brothers and sisters, I remember on April the 3rd, 1968, my brothers and sisters, he flew to Memphis to address a crowd at Mason Temple. He almost didn't get there because his plane was delayed by a bomb threat. He alluded to this threat in his speech that evening saying, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. My brothers and sisters, I believe, my brothers and sisters, Martin Luther King was saying what Paul was saying in Philippians 3 and 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Paul wanted to imitate Christ who showed true humility when he laid aside his rights and his privilege of God and came down to become man. He pulled out his life to pay the penalty we deserve. We're to take Christ's attitude in serving others. Jesus played the hand he was dealt when he died for the sins of this world. And just like Martin Luther King said, he said, because I've been to the mountaintop. But can I tell you about another man who put a cross on his shoulder and marched up a hill called Calvary. And he, he gave his hand to the nail and his feet to the rivet. And then he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And then he pierced him in his side. He hung his head and he died. But he's saying, I'm in a no-lose situation. When they place him in a borrowed tomb, and he stayed there three days and three nights. But he says, I'm in a no-lose situation. When on that third day morning, he got up with all power in his hand, with saving power, with healing power, with delivering power, with redeeming power. He said, I'm in a no-lose situation because now I'm seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on behalf of the saints. I'm in a no-lose situation. My brothers and sisters, I don't know what's going to happen on tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But Paul's position, and it should be our position this morning, to remind ourselves that we're in a no-lose situation because as long as we're in Christ and Christ in us Paul says to live is gain and to die is gain because we can run on just a little while longer to see what the end is going to be but one day we got to pass from this life to the next and that's good news that I am in a no lose situation God be the glory. This is our message. I'm in a no-lose situation. Standing all over the building. We offer Christ. Come by view a letter, Christian experience, or a candidate for water baptism. God bless you may keep you is our prayer. Now the choir may sing.